These factual recall questions are to ensure you know the key pieces of information from the A-level chemistry specification for the bonding topic. If you look in the description below, there's a link to a worksheet so that you can complete the questions in advance and then use this video to check your answers. Solvate ions are SO4 and they have a two minus charge. Hydroxide ions are OH with a single minus charge. Nitrate ions are NO3 with a single minus charge. Carbonate ions are CO3 with a double minus charge. And ammonium ions are NH4 with a single positive charge. Your four types of crystal are ionic, metallic, macromolecular, or you might also call it giant covalent, and also simple molecular, or just molecular for short. Your named examples are sodium chloride for ionic, magnesium for metallic, although of course you could have any of the elemental metals, diamond for macromolecular or giant covalent, or you could also have graphite, and iodine for molecular, or you could also have ice. An ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between some oppositely charged ions that are formed together into a lattice. In order to have an ionic bond, we need to have some ions. So the first stage in the process is electron transfer from a metal to a non-metal. This then creates the ions, and then it's the force of electrostatic attraction between those positively and negatively charged ions, which leads to the ionic bond. A substance may have covalent character if those electrons are being more shared rather than polarized. So basically, if there's not a sufficiently large difference in electronegativity between the cation and the anion. And this can occur for a few reasons. So the first one is if we have quite a small cation. And this is going to affect it because the smaller the cation, the more concentrated that positive charge is. So this increases the charge density. Alternatively, you may have a large anion, and this is going to affect it because the larger the anion is, um, and here we're talking about the number of shells, so the more shells that anion has, the further away those valence electrons are from the nucleus, and therefore the more easily they are polarised. Finally, it's also likely to occur where we have a large charge on either ion. This is going to lead the substance to have a lower than expected melting point compared to if it was purely ionic. Now, the perfect ionic model makes a few assumptions. Firstly, it says that we have point charges. So in other words, these ions don't take up any space at all. They're just a single point in space. Also, we expect that these ions are perfectly spherical. So they're completely uniform and the electrons are equally distributed all over the sphere. And finally, we have none of that covalent character that we've just described in question six. Elements in group one form ions with a single positive charge, in group two with a two positive charge, in group six with a double negative charge, and in group seven with a single negative charge. If I'm going to look at an ionic compound like vanadium oxide and try to work out what the overall symbol formula is, firstly I need to take account of that Roman numeral. So that tells me that the vanadium is going to have a four plus charge. And then oxide of course being group six, that's going to be two minus. So I look at the four and the two and I need to look at the lowest common multiple, which for these two will be four. So then I think about what do I need to multiply those by to get that lowest common multiple. So the four, I don't need to do anything at all, but the two minus will need doubling. And that tells me that I'm going to need two oxide ions for every one vanadium ion. So that gives me an overall formula of VO2. A covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. And then, of course, we have that electrostatic attraction between that shared pair of electrons and the two positive nuclei of the atoms. And that's what holds the whole thing together. But the key thing is this shared pair of electrons. And we draw that covalent bond with a single straight line between the atoms. Graphite conducts electricity because it, like a metal, has delocalized electrons. And these are free to move and to carry charge through the substance. It's soft and slippery because it's made of these planes or layers, and they're able to slide over each other because there are only weak intermolecular forces between them. It has a high melting point because it's a giant covalent substance or a macromolecular substance, and therefore in order for it to be melted, we need to break a lot of strong covalent bonds. And because those strong covalent bonds are so strong, this requires a lot of energy. A coordinate bond is a covalent bond, so a shared pair of electrons, where both of those electrons have come from one atom. Coordinate bonds are also known as dative covalent bonds, and in order to draw them, we do an arrow rather than just a line, and the arrow goes from the atom that's donating that pair to the atom that is sort of receiving it, or you know, the second atom that's participating in that bond. 
A metallic bond is the electrostatic force of attraction between the sea of delocalized electrons and the positive ions in a metallic lattice. And it looks a little bit like this. So we've obviously got our positive ions and then around them is that sea of delocalized electrons. Metallic substances, just like graphite, can conduct electricity because they have this sea of delocalized electrons and these are able to move through the substance and carry charge. Ionic substances can conduct electricity, but only when the ions are free to move because you need charged particles that can move. Of course, in an ionic substance, we don't have delocalized electrons. It's those free ions that are carrying the charge. So in order for them to be free to move, we can't have a solid ionic lattice. Instead, the substance either needs to have been melted or it needs to have been dissolved to form an aqueous solution. If we look at chlorine, sodium chloride and magnesium, we're going to find that sodium chloride has got the highest melting point and chlorine has got the lowest melting point, And this is down to their relative bonding. So the sodium chloride, of course, is ionic and magnesium is metallic and chlorine is molecular. And once we know that, we can consider the amount of energy that it takes to overcome the forces between the particles. So in ionic bonding, we have this strong electrostatic force of attraction between the positive and negative ions. And that is a stronger force than the electrostatic attraction between the positive ions and the delocalized electrons in magnesium. So that's why the sodium chloride has a higher melting point than magnesium. And then both of those are stronger than the weak intermolecular forces that need to be overcome in order to separate chlorine molecules. Remember, of course, although there are strong covalent bonds inside the chlorine molecule, they are not being broken when chlorine is turning into a liquid and then turning into a gas. We're not talking about atomization here. We're just over overcoming those weak intermolecular forces. And that takes very little energy at all, which is why chlorine is a gas at room temperature, whereas magnesium and sodium chloride, of course, are both solids. The repulsion between two lone pairs of electrons is stronger than the repulsion between one lone pair and a bonding pair. And both of those are stronger than the repulsion between two bonding pairs of electrons. Now that's important because the only way in which it's possible to accommodate the lone pairs being further apart because they're repelling each other more is to reduce the bonding angle between the bond pairs. And that's going to be reduced by about two and a half degrees per lone pair. Now the next bit isn't strictly factual recall because there aren't named examples of molecules in your specification for the different shapes, but the same molecules tend to come up again and again. So if you're familiar with them, then you save yourself some time in the exam because you're not having to work out what the bond angle would be because you already know. So common examples of linear molecules include carbon dioxide, but also beryllium chloride or indeed beryllium hydride. And of course, the bond angle in a linear molecule is 180 degrees because it's just a straight line. Trigonal planar molecules, boron trifluoride is a really common example, or you might also see aluminium chloride. And since this is just a flat triangle, we're going to have a bond angle there of 120 degrees. There are lots of tetrahedral molecules you could name. Um, methane would be an obvious one, or you could also have a haloalkane, so something like chloromethane, but also, of course, the ammonium ion. In a purely tetrahedral molecule, we would have a bond angle of 109.5 degrees, but in water, that's not what we see. So if we just quickly draw methane, it looks a bit like this, and that's where we have our bond angle of 109.5 degrees. And a water molecule has a similar shape, but in place of two of those bonding pairs, we've got lone pairs of electrons, and they're the crucial ones. So as we've already mentioned, they repel each other more strongly than the bonding pairs do, and therefore they need to be further apart and that means that to accommodate this, the hydrogen atoms are pushed closer together. And so that gives us a bond angle of about 104.5 degrees instead. There aren't a lot of examples of octahedral molecules. So the one you're going to think of is probably going to be sulfur hexafluoride. If you're at the end of the course and you're revising and you've already done the transition metal topic, then you might also think of lots of the transition metal complexes, which are often octahedral, but of course they're not strictly speaking molecules, so we won't mention them here. The bond angle in an octahedral molecule will be 90 degrees. And electronegativity is about the tendency or the power of an atom to be able to attract the pair of electrons in a covalent bond towards itself. 
we denote polarity using charges, so positive and negative signs, but to show that these are much smaller charges than the charges that we would find on, say, monatomic ions, we use a delta sign because, as you know, delta means a very small change. A molecule might contain polar bonds, but not be polar overall, if those bonds have polarity which is working against each other. So, for instance, if you have a symmetrical molecule, then you could end up with both of the ends of the molecule being positive and the centre being negative or vice versa. So, for instance, if we look at carbon dioxide, oxygen is electronegative, more electronegative than carbon. And so both of those oxygen atoms are pulling the electrons towards themselves. And so we end up with negative charges on either end. But because both ends of the molecule are negatively charged, we don't experience that permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction between molecules because the next carbon dioxide molecule along will also have a negative end and you don't have attraction between two negatives. The three types of weak intermolecular force are your van der Waals forces, your permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction, and of course, hydrogen bonding. The strongest of these is the hydrogen bonding and the weakest of these is the van der Waals forces. It helps to explain why van der Waals forces arise if you know that they're also referred to as instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces, which is a bit of a mouthful, but does explain where this is coming from. So the first thing we need to remember is that electrons do not have a fixed location in space. They're constantly moving and the electron cloud is constantly changing position. So what that means is that we get a temporary uneven distribution of electrons. And this is our instantaneous dipole. In other words, suddenly one side of the molecule or even one side of the atom, because of course van der Waals forces can arise on um, noble gases and things that are just single atoms on their own, suddenly one side has slightly more electrons and therefore we have a slight negative charge compared to the slight positive charge on the other side of the molecule and that's our instantaneous dipole. When that happens, this is then going to start inducing a dipole in other adjacent molecules. So in other words, where I've got a slight negative charge on one side of the molecule, that will repel the electrons in the next molecule and that will create a slight positive dipole. And then because we've got a slight negative on the first molecule and a slight positive on the second molecule, there's then going to be attraction between these dipoles. And that is your van der Waals force. Larger molecules are going to have stronger van der Waals forces purely because they have more electrons. So therefore, it's much more likely from a probability point of view that an instantaneous dipole will arise because it's much more likely that the distribution of electrons won't be completely symmetrical. Hydrogen bonds arise when fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen is bonded to hydrogen in a molecule. And the reason that we're interested in these three in particular is because they are particularly electronegative. Now, remember, the hydrogen bond is not the covalent bond between the fluorine or the oxygen or the nitrogen and the hydrogen. It's a weak intermolecular force. The reason that this happens is that when they bond to the hydrogen, we get a very polar bond and so we get a very strong dipole. So, for instance, if we have some hydrogen fluoride um, molecules here, they all have um, charges like this or dipoles like this. And therefore, we get a very, very strong attraction between the negative of one molecule and the positive of the next molecule. And so those little red lines are our hydrogen bonds. Similarly, you could be asked to demonstrate what the hydrogen bonding in water looks like. So firstly, we need some water molecules. And on those water molecules, it's important that you draw that the lone pairs are all on the oxygen atoms. So each oxygen atom has two lone pairs of electrons. We also need to show the partial charges. So they're your delta positives and delta negatives. And of course, because oxygen is so electronegative, it has the delta negative sign and therefore the hydrogens have the delta positive signs. And then when you draw your hydrogen bonds, it's important that they're going from the lone pair of the oxygen. So not just the oxygen atom in general, but specifically the lone pair. And they go from that lone pair to the hydrogen. It's possible, even if a molecule only has van der Waals forces, for it to have a relatively high melting point or a relatively high boiling point. So, for instance, if you think about polymers, they're often solids at room temperature, despite the fact that they only have van der Waals forces between them. And this is because the larger the molecule is, the stronger those van der Waals forces will be. And so if you have a very large molecule and we compare it to a small polar molecule, it's still possible for those van der Waals forces to end up being larger than the amount of energy that's required to overcome the interactions between those polar molecules.
Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found this video a useful addition to your revision for A-level chemistry. If you did find it useful then let me know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry content coming soon.